Hi, I'm Dave Merlino. I'm Dustin Sweet, and this is the Know Their Story podcast. We talk to veterans about their time in service, returning home from war, and transitioning out of the military. Hopefully along the way, we'll inspire you to do the same with a veteran in your life. Because sometimes all it takes to make the world a better place is sitting down with a friend to know their story. Okay, there we go. We are on again, episode 11 of the Know Your Story podcast. How are you in Taos, New Mexico today, Dustin, now that school has started? Uh, It it claims that it's going to snow here in about 40 minutes, so uh, I don't know. Uh, The clouds are here. It looks like it's going to do the thing. Uh, I don't know, man. We'll see. Well, that's what Uh, you get for living at 7,000 feet above sea I know. It was was 70 yesterday. It's going to be 85 on Friday. Uh, Snow in between. Well, I'm here at about 18 feet above sea level at my house, so we're not going to get your snow, I don't think. <laughs> so, uh, but very special episode today. Joining us from Southern California, Los Angeles, I believe. Um, we have a guest who served in the U.S. Army uh, during Operation Enduring Freedom and Operation Iraqi Freedom in charge of military working dogs. Yeah, I mean, my daughters would absolutely love that job to no end. Um, they loved when I applied to customs, I applied under a canine uh, uh, announcement on the southern border. So of course I ended up non-canine in Seattle, but that's the government for you. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yep. uh, she played rugby for the US Combined Services Women's Team. Uh, and is involved with the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, the IAVA, and has spoken with Congress advocating for veteran unemployment um, issues, timely VA benefits and suicide awareness, as well as worked with the Wounded Warrior Project and advocated with homeless veterans and veterans in danger of becoming homeless. And also I noticed was the VA Veteran of the Day highlighted. Please welcome Sergeant Tracy Cooper Harris. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much, Dave and Dustin, for, for having me on the, the, the podcast. I will apologize in advance if you hear a meow. My, my cat, Clemson, has, has joined us, and he I, I have not fed him because he was being a butt. So he's, <laughs> he's just chilling right here and waiting on me to, to get up. So yeah. just let you know. <laughs> Don't worry. It's not like cats have a single-minded purpose when no, they want to not meal the Not at cat. all. <laughs> so I it's always wonder, because my wife, her quote-unquote office is down the hall from me so sometimes she's on calls and I wonder if the audio comes over one day on one episode man she was just lighting into someone and it was great <laughs> because usually that's me and I got to you know I, I, I would hear some things and I could tell it was someone like trying to answer and I was just like, buddy no just from experience just let it ride yep <laughs> So then I found out it was her boss and I was so proud. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Oh, wow. Even better. (laughs) Well, I always joke that in her role, she's kind of like the command sergeant major and their bosses are like the butter bars at points. Yeah. They don't know what's going to hit them. (laughs) Yeah. So it was, it's a new partner and kind of giving him the, here's some crayons to play with. (laughs) So, uh, but, Dustin, I'm going to let you start. Oh, yeah, I can start this off. Yes, I'm very Great. benevolent. My, yeah. The patented. Uh, so how, how did you end up in the military, Tracy? Um, so uh, I was the only child, uh, and uh, my mom had uh, married my, my stepfather, lovingly known as Pop, and his big thing was, you live under my roof, you have to obey my rules. I said, okay, it's time for me to go. <laughs> So, uh, I so thought the way, joining the army, there would the be mil- the military was better for not having to follow rules. Uh, it was better for a lot more autonomy than it was at home. So my parents were very overprotective. Um, so strict. And, uh, I mean, I would get grounded for, um, I think one time I got grounded for not turning on the light when I was vacuuming. Um, it was, there was light coming in, there was ambient light coming in from the windows. I'm getting grounded for that. I got grounded for, uh, I think, courting a, a, a boy on the front porch, apparently. I didn't even know what courting was. No one could explain it to me. I was, I'm 
like, what? I Yeah. So, uh, like I said, my, my parents were very, uh, very protective of me. And it just got to the point of, uh, at 17, I had to get them to sign up uh, for me <laughs> to, to join the army. And my pop being, um, <laughs> he, my pop was very uh, brash, loud. Um, but that's how he was with folks that he loved. I just didn't figure that out. It took me like 10 years <laughs> to figure that out. Uh, and he basically said, you're signing up for six years. You're not gonna last six months. So um, when my six years was over, of course I had to re-up for two more. <laughs> just, to, just to prove a point. Um, so yeah. I joined the army because I thought, and I actually did end up having like uh, a lot more freedom than I would at home. Uh, but then the, the flip side of that also was, uh, my mom was my mom was sick. She had a, a neurological condition uh, called multiple sclerosis, um, and that's a it affects every it can affect any part of the the body just because your nerves affect everything, and it can affect everything from speech, uh, your balance, uh, you name it. Um, so my mom had had uh, was, was had been fighting with MS for a long time, and uh, by the time I graduated from high school, she has some minor issues with MS, but um, by me joining the army, that would be a means of me, uh, you know, being able to pay for college, uh, being able to get out of the house, be able to do my own thing, kind of grow up a little bit, and for my parents not have to worry about, well, those going to happen with Tracy. So right. I, I saw it like that, and I thought it was like the uh, re responsible uh, thing to do. And, you know, after I'd gotten out and after my mom had passed and, um, my pop and I got along like uh, pretty much oil and fire, fire and gasoline, not even oil and water, fire and gasoline. Um, and we finally kind of had a come to Jesus moment after, after mom had passed. And, you know, we sat down and talked and, uh, it, you know, he, later on he was like, I can't tell you how proud I was of you when you joined the army and all sort of stuff. And that was just like, whoa. So that was like one of those things that, you know, you're, it, it just, it just kind of took me a little bit back for, from that, but. Yeah, the, the, the reason I joined, you know, parent, strict parents, um, and then also uh, a sense of uh, responsibility so my parents wouldn't have to, to necessarily worry about me and, you know, get school taken care of and, and things like that. So it was a it was a win-win situation for me, for the most part. Yeah, it's amazing what time and distance and just sitting down in adulthood, what you can learn you know, I had a much closer relationship with my father in adulthood than I did. You know, my dad ran a business and, and was always working and always going to bed early because he was working. And then in adulthood, you know, everything became really mellow and, and chill between us. So unfortunately, he passed nine years ago. Shocked oh. me. So I had dinner with him one night and the next night he was gone type of thing. Wow. wow. So, my uncle actually had MS and my grandpa just raised, he was a, a tireless fundraiser for MS in his lifetime uh, with the Italian club. And then it became a, um, MS took it over and became a big black tie event where they honored him. And my grandpa was, what would you say, Dustin, five, two, five, three. Oh, maybe. <laughs> uh, standing up there in his tux and, they were, and he said, you know, people ask me, how did you grow this so big? And he's like, well, I'm Italian and I tell people, I've done you a favor. Now you owe me one. And the room was silent because they couldn't tell if he was joking or not. Like, you rule, Grandpa. <laughs> so, um, but so going into the Army, um, did you specialize right away in, in terms of working with, with the, the working dogs? I mean, did you have a background for, for care or? Uh, nothing. Uh, so uh, when I first signed up, uh, the, the military would let you pick uh, what job you wanted. Uh, I wanted to initially go in as a cook, didn't have a driver's license, so they said you can't be a cook. Don't ask me why, that makes no sense. It's just one of those simple, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're really big pots. You gotta... <laughs> yeah, drive with it. Do You're some math, whatever. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's at least that's what the recruiters told me. Oh, you don't have a driver's license. You can't drive. You know, you, you you can't be a cook. They said, "Well, what else do you want to do?" I said, "Well, there's this animal care thing." They're like, "Okay, yeah, we'll put you down." Click. So that's that's how I got it. Um, when I got into uh, AI, AIT, uh, it came back that uh, a, 
a lot of my uh, fellow folks that were in class with me, in school with me, they were like, we had to beg for this MOS. We had to beg for it. And you just chose it and they didn't say anything. I said, I don't know. So it, it was one of those things. I didn't have uh, an animal background. You know, I had pets growing up. Uh, my grandfather had like a uh, kind of like a bodega as a as a kid. So you know he had a he had a German Shepherd for protection. So that's and we had dogs growing up, cats growing up. So that's the only animals I knew of and had. And I, I know you can see um, that's Muhammad Ali in the background right there. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the I just always liked animals, and I just had a great chance to work with them. Um, I didn't actually realize uh, that I would be working with military police dogs until um, I didn't realize I'd be actually working with military police dogs until uh, like after I got to my first duty assignment. I'm like, wait, there's a job where you actually get to handle the dogs? I'm in the wrong job. But you, I found out later on, you have to be a cop. And it was very hard, especially during like the, the, the early 90s, to actually, I think the whole entire time I was in from, 90, so from 91 to 03 to uh, get, uh, to be an, be an MP or master at arms or uh, security forces in the military and actually get that designator to be a handler. You had to go like craziness. And we actually had somebody who tried to uh, reclassify from being a, a vet tech in the army to being a, a handler. And they were, they, we saw them about a year or so later, basically they were working the gate. <laughs> so nothing is, is, is not guaranteed. So I said, well, if that's the case, if I can't be a handler and it's, it's taking a little too long here, let me go ahead and help out the way I can. And, you know, uh, getting to see the, the fun and exciting times of the, of the dogs. We also worked on like the privately owned pets of our uh, active duty and retired military. So we got to see dogs, cats. Um, we had ferrets every now and then. Uh, if our veterinarian was okay with exotics, we'd see exotic animals like, uh, I'm trying to think, birds. Every now and then you'd see um, we also worked on uh, government animals that were um, like uh, horses, because the army has horses. A lot of people don't think about that. Mules, Marines have mules as well. Um, the military mascots, so at all the uh, military academies, they have mascots. We take care of those guys too. Um, I didn't personally, but the, the MOS helps the Army Veterinary Corps officer take care of them. And then individual units, uh, the commander can actually designate uh, a mascot for the unit and someone to take care of said mascot. So we provide care for them as well. So um, like I said, it's a it's a small MOS, it's a fun MOS. Um, the likelihood that if you know somebody who had that, uh, who had that MOS knowing each other, um, especially if they've gotten out like within the last 10 to 15 years, uh, it's, it's within at least one or two degrees of separation is pretty easy. Nice. Yeah, I um, was it the Polish army, I think, in World War II had a grizzly bear that they'd rescued that would uh, smoke and drink with them and carry all their ammo for them. Wow. Yeah. And, and actually uh, loved taking showers and caught a uh, infiltrator because he went into the shower and that's where the guy was hiding. And apparently he decided to turn himself in and then hang out in the shower with the grizzly bear. <laughs> They, they must have put some serious work into that bear because uh, if, a, if an animal loves you, they, yeah, <laughs> that's a, love. so they took some really good care of that bear. Rescue. Yeah, it's a cool story. We, yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about writing a um, script for it, but you're going to have to have an animated bear the whole time. It, it gets too expensive. <laughs> how, so uh, how, how old were you when you finally got your driver's license? Um, I got it at 18. Uh, which, uh, so I'm originally from New Jersey. Uh, we moved to South Carolina when I was, uh, when I was 16. So um, right in time for Hurricane Hugo. <laughs> uh, so South Carolina, I think the age to drive, at, you get your learner's permit at 15 and drive at 16. In New yeah. Jersey, uh, learner's permit at 17, drive at 18. But nobody drove at 18 because it was, it was too expensive. The insurance right. was astronomical. So, and you know, 
So I did finally get the license, but it just, you know, just, just took a little time. And, you know, um, my pop was, my pop was busy. Mom was, mom was getting sick. So I was just like, yeah, whatever. We, I eventually got it. I eventually passed the test, but it just, it just took a little bit longer. Well, now you're in LA. We're driving. It's so fun. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> if I don't have to drive or if I basically, you know, plan an hour ahead to, to drive to one place, if I have to sit there and wait for 30, 40 minutes, I'm fine. I just don't like being stuck in traffic. Which we, is we've picked up, yeah, we've picked up more than a few parking tickets of like, I thought that sign said like, it's okay on this day, but mm -hmm. not from three to four. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. They got to get their money somehow. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, yeah. and they're gonna need more and more and more. Uh -huh. um, so you, like I, I was mentioning earlier, you were part of Enduring Freedom and Iraqi Freedom, taking care of the, the military working dogs. Um, what's that like in, in in terms of? I mean, obviously, just in your normal assignment on base, that's got to be one thing. But actually, when you're talking about deployed. Um, is it mainly the care? Is it a lot of coordination? Seems like something you'd need a license for. <laughs> so what was what was interesting was this. Um, when our unit deployed, our unit actually, uh, they kind of split the unit in, it wasn't even a full half, but they split us in two. Um, so you had uh, detachment two that went to, that basically took care of Af Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, um, and that was it. The rest of the unit was uh, spread out all over the rest of the, the AOR. And uh, they had two uh, locations that were uh, one person duty locations. So they sent their most senior uh, tangos uh, to the location. I had just gotten to the unit. Like um, I signed into the unit in January of 2002. Um, we got activated in July of 2002. We were boots on the ground in August of 2002 for Enduring Freedom that rolled into Iraqi Freedom. Um, so our commander pulled us aside and uh, there was uh, one of my other sergeants who uh, went to uh, Oman and that was a one man duty assignment and I went to Kyrgyzstan. So uh, I was in charge of altogether, um, it started off as, I think it was eight uh, US military working dogs, plus uh, working dogs from France. So that was like, well, what? <laughs> wow. um, so this, this is the first time I'm getting to like, actually uh, provide some type of support for uh, you know, animals that are outside the, the US. So I'm like loving this. This is like, for me, like a dream come true because you don't get to see this type of stuff. So we got to see how like, they were able to do uh, the differences in training, the differences in, you know, how they do the apprehension and all this other stuff. And it was, uh, you know, it, it was, it was just awesome to see. Luckily, no one got uh, hurt too much uh, on our, uh, during uh, our, our time out there. But uh, I think the, 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 the big difference was, uh, so I was out there by myself with my unit. I had to, uh, and basically I had to work with the, the Air Force while I was out there to, you know, help me with like supplies and stuff like that, which, you know, it, it was still okay. Um, uh, we went from, so I worked with the, uh, we had US working dogs, French working dogs, the French left, and then it was uh, the, it was EPAC, which was uh, basically a combination of Norwegian and uh, Norway and Denmark working dogs that came through and there were I want to say that there were four or five, there were five or six dogs that, that came from, from those countries. Um, and uh, like I said, it was just, you know, uh, they had their, their whole setup with um, their kennels, uh, their food supply, water supply, all that good stuff. So um, the only thing I needed was to make sure that, you know, if something happened to any of the dogs that I could provide basic first aid, things like that. Um, but since uh, I was like the first person who had actually been at this assignment and was actually, I wanted to make sure there was like a contingency plan or something, you know, proverbial shit hit the fan. Um, so I made sure that there was a, um, I coordinated with the, the Air Force to, what do we have to do? We needed to medevac a dog out. 
um, the closest army veterinarian was my unit, that detachment I was telling you about that was in Bagram in Afghanistan. Yeah. Um, so we had to, uh, you it's know, not close by. yeah, it's, it's like a, it, it was two hours. Uh, by, <laughs> by plane. Um, so it, the shit hit the fan. I'd have to stabilize the dog. We'd have to get on the C-130, fly out, you know, get into Afghanistan, then, you know, transfer custody of care to, you know, uh, the the captain and the major uh, at Bagram, um, let them know what was going on, and then also have like a plan if they didn't have everything that they needed there, where would be the next steps and the next steps and the next steps. And I, because of the how small the MOS is, um, and because I just got off of active duty in 99, I still had connections to um, the, uh, the uh, veterinary general hospital in Germany for working dogs. And uh, I had an old supervisor who had connections to Lackland Air Force Base out oh, in. Cool. So we, we, I at least had it on paper, knock on wood, nothing, <laughs> nothing happened to that point, but that was the type of thing that, that I, that I was doing over there. And it sounds, you know, um, I'm a little bit of a geek. So that type of thing, I was like, Oh, this is exciting. Let's, let's see about this. And what can we do here? And what can we do there? And what can we make sure that uh, the dogs have what what training can I provide the the handlers? Uh, let's make sure do they need any medications or okay on flea and tick procs, stuff like that because it's not like we go out in town and just oh we need some this or whatever. Right. Uh, so 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 it was that type of thing. It was it wasn't more um, admin stuff, but it was just like those little things just to make sure that we're taken care of. So if if something did happen that you wouldn't kind of be caught well, why isn't this done? Well, how come the care didn't happen here? And it, it, it would end up falling on me. So, and I didn't want that. And I also wanted to set whoever's coming behind me up for success as, as well. Um, unfortunately, about, I'd say seven or eight years after I left, they closed down the whole base. So, you know, but that's, that's kind of typical with the military, you know, <laughs> but, I, you know, at least for the, the time I was there, um, I thought for the, for the most part, I, I, I made it a little bit better and was able to provide, uh, you know, at least the, the, the veterinary side of the house with uh, some of the things they needed to make sure that the, the dogs were provided the best care and such, uh, you know, limited, um, with limited supplies and things like that as, as they could in the best environment that, that could be done. So, and uh, that was, that was basically it, but it was, it was a blast. It was a blast to like I said, see uh, the different the different types of dogs that <laughs> other countries had for, for working dogs. Um, the uh, Norwegians had a uh, giant schnauzer for a working oh. dog, a dog you don't see yeah. all the time. So uh, that was like one of the first pictures that I made sure to take, uh, take a picture of. I'm like, because nobody's gonna believe this. Um, the French did have poodles. They didn't bring poodles with them, but they showed me pictures of their dogs that they had like back, uh, back home. Um, and uh, I know like uh, when we ended up going from, uh, when our unit ended up uh, kind of rallying back to Kuwait to push into Iraq, uh, they, uh, we interacted with some of the other uh, military's uh, canine and working dog units out there. And so of course, you know, typical German Shepherds, uh, your Malinois, which are the uh, dogs you see at the airports with the, the uh, dark snout, dark ears. Um, they just look just badass. Uh, the A Dutch Shepherds. percent energy level. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very high energy level. They're, they're great dogs. You just got to work them. <laughs> they, 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 know it's, they know when it's time to work, and they work hard, and they play hard. Um, we also had uh, Dutch Shepherds as well they were like brindle um and uh the english well, excuse me the brits had a uh like uh springer spaniels um and yeah you, you name it you, you saw it out there it was like i said it was uh, you know I, I was having a just great time just interacting and, and talking to folks and a little bit of downtime that, that we did have just to see what was out there so yeah I loved my job absolutely loved it if i you know um, if, if it wasn't just for the Middle East and being as hot as <laughs> hot as hell over there, um, you know, I, I, I definitely probably would have stayed and, and you know, uh, probably been a been a lifer out of it. But it is what it is. 
So when you're saying you're making contingency plans, are you telling me there's not a pet smart down the corner and uh, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, I no. Um I I want to say we did see a couple of like um I know in the Middle East itself, like some of the other places they had like a big thing with the the wild cats out there that weren't um you know, not uh, necessarily uh friendly, <laughs> basically feral cats. Um, so the, the issue is they, they had the, the, the big thing you have to worry about during deployment was, uh, was, was rabies, um, just because uh, other countries don't have as uh, big, a, as good of a vaccination protocol as we do here in the States. So, um, and I was surprised, I learned later on that I think everybody, when they, when they deployed, um, they got their rabies shots. Uh, a, a lot of folks did. So I, I thought it was just us, because of course we're veterinary, and it makes sense. Um, but um, found out that yeah, everybody got them because uh, especially when we were uh, when when we started pushing forward into Iraq, that that long uh, convoy on that one highway that goes into Kuwait, the convoy stopped at one point in time, and you you're like what did it stop for? And you see this uh, group of must have been like forty dogs and puppies just crossing the street, and of course we're gonna stop, and all I see are like look soldiers like reaching down and trying to pet the puppies. I'm like, no, oh God, they're going to pet them and they, somebody's going to grab them and take them home. And yeah, because. And that's why they all got rabies shots. <laughs> yeah. And it, it, was, it wasn't even the rabies shot at that point. I'm like, we, as Americans, we love animals. And uh, there have been numerous stories about, uh, even after we, we've come back, about um, the military actually uh, finding dogs and cats out there and basically keeping them and then doing whatever they have to do to get them back stateside. So it, 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 it happens. And, I'm, and the thing is, at the time when I was there, that was like, no, it's not going to happen. We're, we're not doing it. The Army saying no. The DOD is saying no. Some, somebody called the congressperson somewhere and said, um, y'all need to take care of this. And so, yeah, it, it, it ended up happening. So, and there's like a, I know there's like a few Facebook groups and stuff like that about folks who, are specifically bringing like Afghanistan dogs, uh, dogs that are in Iraq, cats, you name it, back back home, and you know making sure they got the shots and all that good stuff, and it happens. So that's you know that I think that's one good thing that's that's come out of um, you know being over there and stuff like that. So yeah, cool my uh, trainer I work out with uh, has a rescue dog from Afghanistan. Nice. And that dog is unflappable. Never heard her bark. And I was like, she lived in a war zone, and now she's in Seattle. Like, everything's chill. <laughs> yeah. She's like, I'm good. What? I'm, I'm just moved up. Like, you know, I'm. I've, I've seen a lot. I'm good. You can't do anything to me now. <laughs> now you know, and now people sense. bring me food. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Life. Super nice. We saw, a, uh, we saw a documentary a couple of festivals ago about a guy who was bicycling. Uh, he started off where, for, like France. He went through Afghanistan, and picked up a kitten. And so then he's bicycling around the world with this cat. And uh, where did we see that? Was that in Sedona a couple uh, years ago? Anyway, I think it made me think of all the, like, all the laws. He was talking about, he spent like five minutes talking about how at every border he has to pretend like he either doesn't have a cat in his backpack mm -hmm. or... Uh, or, or that clearly this cat's fine. He's been here the whole time. He's on my bicycle. Come on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. He's, he's been here for a while. For your MOS and working with the handlers, um, and like you said, having to, uh, to airlift uh, one of the, the dogs uh, to Bagram, did you know that, like, one of the veterans we've talked to for our documentary, his first tour in Vietnam, he was a scout dog handler, and then his second tour, he was with Apache Troop. Um, unfortunately, his his dog was reassigned when he went home, and the, the dog and the handler were killed in a booby trap. Mm. And I would say, what do you say, Dust? I'd say even 50 years later, Duke is the loss that he feels. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, no contest. No contest. That's... Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can't even imagine. Um, there was a movie that came out. I want to say it was like a documentary on PBS. It was called War Dogs. Yeah. And basically, they were telling the story of like uh, uh, all the, the handlers uh, and whatnot during Vietnam times with uh, that were in country 
had the dogs, and then at the end of the Vietnam War, we just left the dogs there. And yeah, because it's equipment. Yeah, um, and, and let me tell you something. Um, so I'm also a member of uh, the Vietnam Dog Handlers Association, <laughs> which, is, which was like a random one. It was like, I, I was looking up uh, organizations. And I'm like, I wonder if they have like any like working dog groups or whatever. And I was like, I qualify for membership because all you have to, if you are a handler, a veterinarian or vet tech, <laughs> you know, active duty, uh, you could you could apply. And, you know, seeing some of their stories and the heartbreak and just, it's, I, I can't even imagine because the, the stories of heroism that you hear about dogs through the, basically ever since, uh, with, even during like World War I to today, um, and the, the love that that handler has for that dog is just amazing. I, I can't even imagine uh, leaving those dogs behind. And, you know, I, I'd heard the stories of, of uh, those, those, those guys in Vietnam actually being like, you know, a couple of them basically squirreling something together and actually like getting their dogs back. Uh, like, you know, basically shipping the dog back home. They, they worked with somebody and, and, and got, it, got it that way. Few and far between, but you know, my heart breaks every time I hear stories like that, just because you know that type of bond that they have. I mean, those dogs saved so many lives over there. Um, yeah. And just were, you know, even even in the, the craziest times, uh, were a source of like uh, inspiration, joy, just loyalty, everything oh, else. Just love, and, just, yeah. just love in a loveless place, man. Yeah, yeah. And you know, those dogs put themselves on the line, but you know that those, uh, that those, I, I could say kids because you know they were all kids back then. Um, what what loyalty and love that they had for their dogs, and it went up and down that leash all the time. So, you know, God bless those guys for 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 doing what they did. And uh, you know, I think one of the reasons now that uh, dogs aren't considered equipment anymore um, is because of of what uh, they went through in Vietnam. Um, and you know, moving forward, and we, we just we, we can't leave those the, those dogs yeah. behind. They're more than just equipment. Um, equ equipment can't um, basically sit there and just detect like they do, put themselves in the line like they do. That's that's love there. Right? This is the the least that we can do to uh, get you know basically take care of them. And I actually have a, a buddy of mine who's a she was a. a uh, master of arms in the Navy. So she was, a, she was a handler and actually she has her own, um, she actually runs her own uh, rescue for uh, retired military working dogs. Um, and that is a, a, a labor of love. Um, I, I, I tell you what, um, she, she literally will like drive um, uh, across the country, like to pick up dogs. And I'm talking, not just like, some of these dogs are dogs that it's like, you know, um, some of them are, are fine with people. Some of them, you know, they, they got they're a little quirky. Kind of like veterans, you know. Some of us are not good with other people, other animals, whatever. But you know what? She makes sure that she's that these dogs are are living their best lives, and it's the the, the, the least that she could do for them. And um, I, the the name of the organization is uh, the Damien Project. It's Damien with two Ds. Uh, and the significance of the, the two Ds and the in the names of, of any military working dog is uh, the military actually started uh, their own uh, uh, program where they breed the puppies at Lackland. This started like sometime in, had to be the, the early 2000s. So this was like, uh, I think right after I, after our unit uh, came back home or somewhere around that time frame. So uh, you know that those dogs are from uh, Lackland and are basically homegrown by the double letter in their first name. So if you ever get a dog um, that has a you know double letter that you know you can trace their their roots and their ancestry uh, back to Lackland. And uh, if if I lived in Texas, that would probably be one of the first things I'd do: would be fostering some uh, some some puppies and uh, you know helping to you know get them ready to be the next uh, set of. Uh, future military working dogs for, for the military. So it's a great job. Lackland's a, a great place. And I, you know, I, it's, it would be uh, amazing just to, you know, be able to give back to 
uh, the dogs, the communities, and um, my, my friend Crystal, she uh, actually, um, you know, it's a kennel, but it's not like she's just, they're just living in the kennel and that's it. I mean, they're living the dog's life. I mean, she's actually taking like some of the dogs out. They're still doing like tracking. Um, they're actually going out there and she's like finding stuff that they, the dogs want to do and they're good at, you know, she's doing like launch pad jumping with the dogs where, you know, you're um, basically in the pool of water just to see how far the dog jumps, stuff like that. I'm just like, I, you know, I, I, I'm just in awe of, of, of everything she's done. And then also um, there's another organization. It's a canine, uh, a mission canine rescue, excuse me. Um, and they also uh, do uh, uh, help folks who want to adopt either a retired military working dog or a retired contract working dog. So um, both of them, good organizations. Uh, so if you have if there are any dog lovers out there and they want to, uh, you know, either donate to uh, uh, the Damien Project for, for her dogs and things like that. And she actually uh, helps uh, uh, Mission Canine Rescue and, and vice versa because they, they all know each other, um, you know, definitely check them out. They're, they're good organizations, good folks, and, you know, they're dog people. So you already know that's good right there, right from the jump. Yeah. Dog people, good people. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's proven that dogs do feel PTS, and they do feel the loss of their handlers, and they deserve, you know, it, it drive me crazy when we're talking about them being you know, equipment in Vietnam. It's kind of like, okay, oh, you, you have this SKS and, and uh, grenade launcher that you have as a trophy. Go ahead and bring that home. Like, oh, can I bring my dog too? Nah, it's too expensive. Like, yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, what? <laughs> yeah, it seems backwards. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was. And, you know, now there are opportunities that folks can uh, adopt them, bring them home, stuff like that. So that's, I'm, I'm glad that that is something that, that has changed. So, Slowly but surely, uh, yep. but yeah, they're they're not considered equipment anymore. So, yeah, yeah no, it's a good, it's a good, they're good steps. It gets, there's more to do, but there's good steps forward. Mm -hmm. uh, when when you got out, what did you? What was the first thing you do? How did you? How did you end up rotating out? <laughs> oh boy! So um, we got uh, involuntarily extended. Uh, this is when the army was still doing. Um, six month rotations, but our orders were written for a year. Right. Um, so, you know, we were first, uh, our orders were for enduring freedom. And then uh, we got spread out everywhere. Then we came back to Kuwait and they said, oh, uh, the commanding general said that uh, we did such a good job that we're going to be pushing forward into Iraq. Yay, aren't you glad? I'm like, what? like dude my birthday is coming up i was supposed to be oh man hell with it <laughs> that governor, type of thing. governor no uh, great. Yeah. i always do a good job but not an excellent job <laughs> right so this is our reward for, for doing a good job um, yay i was like oh great yeah so um we stayed uh i think we were one of the we weren't the we, we were one of the one of the first units that stayed like longer in country than just the six months and i i, I remember telling some other folks i'm like y'all if this is happening to us it's probably gonna happen to y'all too and i think a few months after we returned home um <laughs> sure as shit if i didn't see the uh <laughs> something come out of the news yes army now doing 18 month deployments i'm like i'm sorry <laughs> i felt so bad i'm like whoops but we had gotten home. Um, but so we we went to the Middle East in August of 2002, and we came back home in May. Uh, so we so we uh, out processed and everything out of Fort Lewis, um, and we had uh, this was still at the time when um, I know later on folks were able to take leave during deployment we didn't have that opportunity so we had enough leave time that we had uh basically we were on leave for almost a good month after we came back home so we didn't get out get out until uh i think it was june 23rd uh 2003 so we just had leave so we were getting paid and all that good stuff um 
I didn't really know what to do. I was just like, okay, I got, I'm sitting on this grip of money because you couldn't spend the, the money you have while you're deployed. Um, and, uh, you know, just uh, did the typical, got to go out and grab a car. Um, I was planning on uh, taking a road trip, seeing some friends, uh, seeing family, and that was it. And then uh, after that, it was just more of a, I really didn't know what to do, where to go. Um, my uh, Zen girlfriend was like, you know, what is wrong with you? Why aren't you getting a job? Why aren't you doing this? And I was just like, you know, and you know, just more or less like, basically what the hell is wrong with you? And I'm like, look, I'm, I'm doing the best I can here. Um, and it took a little bit of time for me to get back into the, the swing of things. Um, I actually started working at the VA uh, about a year after I came home, <laughs> which, which was a good thing, uh, just for the fact that uh, I was able to uh, learn a little bit more about the VA system, what things I needed to do, what things that could be done to help other veterans, uh, especially when they came home. But the bad thing was also, um, we had to talk on the phone with veterans and I can't tell you how many times I talked to veterans that had just come back home too. And you get the, Hey, um, you know, I'm, I'm having this issue here. I don't know what to do. My commander told me not to, not to say anything or we wouldn't be able to come home soon. And yeah, I see, I see you grinning there, Dave. Yeah. You remember. Um, and it was just like, and, and your, or, uh, the really heartbreaking stories were, You'd call somebody uh, like uh, from like World War II, Vietnam, Korea, and like you, you talk to the spouse and they're like, hey, um, you know what? My husband's been having some problems, nightmares. He's been really scaring me lately and all this other stuff. And I don't know what to do anymore. I need somebody who can help us. And, you know, he's in the background. I was like, yeah, I guess it's time. I don't, I don't mean to scare you anymore. I mean, it's just like, oh my gosh. And it's heartbreaking to hear some of this stuff on, on the phone and you're only on there for like maybe 10, 15 minutes. And so you're trying to help out as best they can, but this is also, you know, bringing up some stuff for you as well. And, and you know, you have to go, Oh, I have these issues as well. And every now and then you get a, a veteran that come on the phone and say, uh, young lady, you sound like you were in the military. I said, yes, sir. I was army. Well, did you, did you go anywhere? You see anything? I said, uh, you know, I was in the Middle East for a little bit. I'll tell you, go get some, make sure you go get some help. I'm an old man now. And I, you know, I didn't get help until I was older. You make sure you take care of yourself now. So, you know, when you get to be older like me, you're not still fighting this stuff. It won't be as, it won't be as bad. And, you know, to hear somebody like just put that kind of wisdom and knowledge on you is just like, damn. That's hot. Damn. Yeah, that's, that's and this is just talking on the phone. Yeah, I, and you know, I, I'm not seeing these people. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you want to say that was, uh, you know, good, uh, good phone skills or, or whatever. I, I don't know, but you know, I, I try to make folks feel comfortable and, and stuff like that. You, you couldn't hang up the phone on a veteran. Um, if they wanted to talk, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna listen. What, whatever they got to say. You know, if it was something that was you know, thought harm, you know, I'd go ahead and, you know, like, I'm, I'm going, to, I can transfer you, but I'm gonna do a real warm transfer to somebody type of yeah. thing. But, it, you know, it was stuff like that. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it was, it was a challenge to, to work at the, the VA. And I, I couldn't, you know, I thought I was stronger than what I was. And that, you know, you know, I'm a badass, I could do it on my own, you know, <laughs> a strong black woman, I, I'm fine, I can, I can handle this. And I, I couldn't, and then, you know, the, the relationship I was in, uh, seemingly serious after five years was a casualty of the war. Um, we just, uh, just fell out of it. And I was just, I was just numb to a lot of stuff, just <clears throat> everything. Um, the only thing that, that, that really kept me going was rugby. It, that, that honestly was it. Um, basically, you know, hitting people, uh, being able to just focus on what does the team have to do? What does, uh, you know, what do I need to do to get better at this? Which wasn't necessary, which was a good thing, but then also at the same time, not the best thing. Um, 
the the jobs that I had since I'd gotten out. Basically, they kind of bounced all over the place as well. Um, I worked for the VA, ended up working for animal services uh, for the city of LA. Um, and that wasn't necessarily <laughs> uh, the best fit either, uh, just because I ended up uh, basically, uh, it wasn't necessarily cussing somebody out over the phone, but I hung up on somebody for, uh, and basically chewed them out for doing something. Uh, it was a mistake on their part, but they tried to make it on my part. And I said, I'm not doing this. And I, I really thought I was gonna be fired. And they were like, they, you know, my, my supervisor and everybody saw me the next day, they're just like, hey, <laughs> everything okay? I'm like, <laughs> I'm still okay with this job. They're like, yeah, you know, it was so and so, we know them, they <laughs> type of thing. So the, the, the transition back home for me, um, like a lot of other veterans, it was, uh, it, it was, it was rocky. It was, it was hard. Um, the, the stuff that, that I experienced over there, um, basically in the Middle East from all the time in the military, I didn't really talk to anybody about it. I, I really didn't. Um, I, you know, I didn't tell my pop about anything, <laughs> um, mainly because I didn't want to scare him, um, or make him think anything was, uh, you know, wrong. Um, you know, while I was in the military, not during deployment, but before that, I was uh, uh, basically I was a victim of blackmail uh, because of my uh, orientation, and uh, didn't tell my family because uh, uh, my pop side of the family they're they're a little, they're a little, they're a little crazy, and in a good way. Um, basically, they're the type of family that if somebody messes with somebody in the family, all five of the brothers are getting together and they're going on a car ride. And yeah, whatever problem, cool. yeah, yeah, whatever problem there was, it's not going to be there anymore. But there's going to be about five more. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One problem solved, two more created. <laughs> no, there's there's not there's going to be a solution, and the problem is gone, and that's it. And we just leave it at that. And I, I and the thing is, so I definitely didn't want to tell them what happened to me uh, when I was in the military, uh, but uh, it kind of came out later on, and one of my aunts saw. Uh, basically uh, a letter I had written to uh, the president about my, my experience with uh, military sexual trauma and the blackmail. And she was like, Tracy, baby, why don't you tell us about this? I said, I said, you know my pop? <laughs> and I said, this happened a while ago, so don't just, just, just leave it alone. Just, you know, I'm, su I'm surprised he didn't see it because he, you know, the older people, they sit up there and they watch, uh, those news, uh, 24 hour news cycle, like it's, <laughs> like it's, like it's, uh, you know, the world series of baseball, they will watch that 24 seven. So, but yeah, all that, uh, you know, the, the transition was, it was, was a challenge to say the least. Um, like a lot of veterans, uh, I, uh, did struggle with the uh, suicidal ideation and things like that. Um, and that's something that, you know, it's something that nobody likes to talk about, but it, it, it comes up. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I, you know, basically wanted to, you know, get uh, advocate on behalf of veterans is, you know, whatever crappy experience I went through, you know, whether it was dealing with the VA, dealing with the military, whatever, if my crappy story, if in, in my telling my crappy story, my experience can basically change the system and make it better for anybody coming up behind me, I'll, 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 I'll take that little bit of pain if it can help somebody else. Um, and, uh, you know, getting on the, the back to the suicide, uh, we lost a, a captain in my unit that was like the, the one guy that like kept the unit together. I mean, this this guy was um, amazing veterinarian. Um, I want to say he, I think he still has a scholarship in his name um, at the, the vet school that he went to. And uh, when, you know, when we heard, when I heard that we lost him, I thought that one of my sergeants was, was playing a joke because he was always the one 
you know, sending like dirty, crazy emails or whatever. I'm like, Sarge, you can't be making a joke about this. He's like, no. And they, he calls me and said, no, Tracy, no. He, he really died. I'm like, and you know, spiral. Um, that that was that was like one of the one of the hardest things I had to deal with. I think the second hardest suicide I, I had to deal with was uh, um, there was a there was a guy that I um, worked with, where basically we we met through uh, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Um, you know, we we done like veterans events and stuff like that through there. He lived out here in California. Um, and he was one of the sweetest guys you'd ever meet. His name was Clay Hunt, Marine Corps veteran, sniper, just, you know, badass, but like one of the most unassuming people you ever meet, like most folks. And, uh, we were, uh, IVA, uh, this was a while back every year he did a, a thing called storm the hill that where they talked to members of Congress. And when they talked to those, uh, uh, congressional members about, issues that we surveyed our veterans on like these are our big ticket items these is what these are issues that we want congress to know are affecting us these are the things i think we could do to solve them can you help us out right. um and so we've been doing we've been doing storm the hill i think every year since like 2004 or 5 i think and uh i went in 2011 uh and uh clay went in 2010 um so Everybody on the the next the you know the the following year of course knew him worked with him or whatever, and uh, we got a message that um, uh, Clay had just moved to to Houston Texas he, from California was starting a new job looked like everything was going great for him, and then we found out he killed himself, and I'm like wait Clay, Clay, the guy that I mean a smile that could light up the room a guy that um you know he was like the biggest proponent of you know don't uh don't basically you know say that i'm not good enough to get care or treatment you know make sure you you talk to somebody make sure you get help make sure you're helping other veterans you know he was doing like ride recovery he was involved in like you name it, he was involved in it. He was like one of the first people that uh, was involved in uh, Team Rubicon. Wow. Okay. We're going back. Uh, so the, the, the veteran circle in LA is, is kind of is big and small at the same time. Clay knew um, the, uh, the guy who started Team Rubicon, which is uh, Jacob Wood. They, they were both in the same unit together. So, wow. you know, and I knew Jacob because we were failing the same German class at Pasadena City College, just a small world. Um, and I know that, that Jake, you know, wouldn't remember me or anything like that. It's just, a, a, it's always a, a fun story. But this, this is like one of those things, like, I can't believe he's gone. Yeah. And so, you know, this is one of the things that uh, when and I was still, we were still big with IVA. Um, we went to Congress and said, we got to do something better because there were so many holes that fell through the gaps for veterans when it came to suicide that the VA could correct that we went ahead and, and uh, made sure that, that we helped to get uh, legislation passed. And it was uh, the Clay Hunt Suicide Act. Um, and and we, we got it passed and we got to see, a few of us got to see uh, President Obama actually sign the bill into law. Um, oh. And it was just, wow, that, that was, uh, that was, was, was something else. Um, we got to meet uh, Clay's parents, the selfies. Um, we, yeah, that, that was like, you know, one of those things that at least his legacy will, will live on. And, you know, even to this day, like all the, all the folks who were like, I call them the, like the old school members of IAVA when we had the, the original <laughs> like written out logo of IAVA who, who remember Clay and stuff like that. You know, anybody who met him, you know, you're just gonna be touched by him. He had the, um, my, my running joke is, he had the prettiest eyes on a boy I'd ever seen in my life. Just like, and I would always joke with him like, Clay, oh my God, seriously. 
your eyes are like, what? I'm like, I'm not trying to hit on you, you know what I'm saying. He's like, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's like those things like that. You, you lose a beautiful soul like that, uh, you know, because uh, of some gaps in the system, because some things that were just wrong, that were just, you know, that, that could have been, that could have been prevented. That hopefully uh, this bill will mean that this law now will mean that his that his existence, that his struggle, even with all the help that he was trying to get and advocate for veterans, you know, getting out there, doing more, making sure they they knew that suicide and asking for help wasn't a show of weakness, that his living wasn't in vain. And if you know if that can happen, especially now with this this pandemic, and it's hard to you know, connect, reach out to folks. And this is like one of those times that, you know, we, we all need to make sure that we, we're, we're still connecting with folks. We're still reaching out to folks. Um, yeah. We talked with um, Lieutenant Colonel Lozano last week and mm. you know, with the Marines and he had a Marine reach out to him because five of his squad mates had committed suicide since the lockdowns began. And it is so important just the reach outs just the text just the text message of how are you doing um you know it i think and you know it's been hard on all of us you know like i said my daughters went back to school today which means they went, left their bedroom and went to the kitchen table um but everyone has something and one of i don't want to use the word unintended one of the unforeseen things of, of Apache Blues, the movie that we're doing is, you know, some of these guys had never, never talked about Vietnam, never, ever, ever, ever until they sat down in the chair with us, which was, it was weird because Dustin does the sound and I do the interviewing and as a filmmaker, you know, there's just some moments where you're like, oh my God, this is, this is amazing. And as a human being, you're kind of like, God, I caused this, but you could also see the relief in them from when they talked about it. So that was four years ago. And in that four years, we've gone from guys who've never talked about it to guys who have who've been able to, you know, they're talking to their families and talking to friends and now suddenly want to talk, you know, like the phone call you had, they want to talk to the younger generation and say, do not wait 50 years like we did. Do not wait um, you know, it's, it is, it is a hard thing to talk about with your family. You know, how do you tell them these guys were in combat five days a week with what they did? And how do you tell your kids about the gunfights that you had, um, and the engagements, but once they started talking and to watch that and, and to see them, and especially for these guys who were you know, they to other Vietnam veterans, these guys are one of the pinnacles. And to see them sit down and say, it's normal, we've gone through it, it's okay. Like, yeah, just to say it's hard for me, you know, it, it's such a good example of, um, of being a good, I don't know, if that's the right, being good is the right, but it's such a, it's such a brave example of, of stepping forward and say, you know, uh, it's hard for me. It's hard for anybody to say. And when you see people who you admire step forward and say, it's hard for me, you know, or when you, when you do it yourself, you end up, you know, you don't know who looks up to you until, you know, way later. And then, and you know, it's, it's fascinating for me to watch, um, to watch their, to watch them watch themselves talk about it, you know, uh, yeah, that one of the most terrifying things we did as filmmakers was screen the the rough cut of the documentary to Apache Troop. And, you know, it's not a scripted thing like, hey, we've taken your lives and boiled it down into two hours. Hope you like it. But we'll be at by the back door in case you don't. <laughs> um, but, yeah, just to see how... You know, we've had so many other veterans saying that could have been me in that chair. You know, the stories are out there. Um, yeah, and and like we were talking about before before we started the episode, we meet so many veterans who want to 
I don't know if it's consciously or subconsciously or trying to not put themselves out there and not want to go to the VA because other people quote unquote deserve it more. And, you know, we have, we had talks even in North Carolina this last summer, like, Oh, well you look at him, like he did way more. And it's like, that so like, <laughs> it's not, it's not a fixed pie. Like you don't take from others. Like you all deserve it. Um, it's so hard to break through that, that, that kind of shell really. Yeah. It's, sure a, it's, it's one of those all gave some and some gave all. And the thing is, you know, I know, in the, the veterans community, somewhat, especially online, we can be a little bit uh, toxic, just, uh, you know, well, you know, I'm infantry, you know, you were just, you were just supply, you didn't really do anything, you didn't really see anything. But the thing is this, um, you know, we've had uh, tragedies in peacetime and wartime. Um, yeah. And, you know, the things that, that, that people have seen, even like during training accidents, um, you know, military sexual trauma, uh, just, oh gosh, just uh, even like WTF moments, like in the military, uh, you know, the distress, everything, that all has an effect on you. And some people can handle it better than others. And that, you know, some people can't. And, you know, it's almost like, a, uh, you know, I have all this stuff that I'm dealing with and, you know, my trauma is worse than yours. This is not a, who had it worse. Everybody had some issue that they're dealing with. Some people had it worse than others, but just because I had it worse than you or you had it worse than me doesn't mean that that negates the, the level of pain that you're experiencing. Um, and I think that's hard for, for, some, for some veterans, some even civilians to, to kind of, you know, wrap their their, their brain around, you know, um, my MOS was not combat, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, I don't necessarily bring up a lot of stuff that, that I went through just because, you know, I don't, I don't want to be compared to, oh, you know, like basically like a Medal of Honor recipient, <laughs> like, ooh, yeah, it been a lot. I, my, my journey does not compare, but the, what I have to realize in moving forward is, you know what, their experience is unique to them. I can't compare my experience to theirs. The only thing I can do is, you know, at the, the very least, um, if they need it, offer support um, and, you know, listen, if anything. Um, I think in the, the veterans community, especially the folks that um, have really seen some traumatic stuff, the folks that have the, uh, basically the hardware to prove that they are badasses, but never say anything about it. Uh, they, the, they're, the, 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 the folks that are like silent and don't say anything, get into like all the, the fray of the stuff. Those are, those are the ones that, you know, I love listening to because, you know, they're, they are soft-spoken. They're not trying to judge you for, oh, well, you were just a this. It's like, no, you, you did your part. You did a role without, you do an A, I wouldn't have been able to do B because it's still interconnected in, in the military. Um, and, and, and that's it. I mean, I, I want to say it was la last year, year before last, I met a gentleman who was a, a prisoner of war um, who was, my God, I think he was a uh, hundred years old. I thought they were BSing me. This man looks so good at a hundred. Um, and he was telling me a story. I am crying the entire time this this man's story I actually looked it looked it up a little bit and was crying even more um long story short uh he used uh some of his skills in, in translating to uh basically uh get medical supplies and medicine for uh the troops in, under his care at the pow camp that were sick um, he was able to basically kind of negotiate with some of his captors and stuff like that because all everything was, I need to take care of my troops. What can I do to take care of them? This isn't about me. What can I do? I need to get home to my family. I need to get home to, and this, this guy, like I said, the most unassuming, just quiet man you ever want to meet. And it's just like, it's like, I, I just want to take care of my, my troops. My troops were the most important thing. They're, they're what kept me going on. 
and he was talking about uh, another veteran who was with him at the, the, the POW camp. And I guess uh, um, this was the gentleman who was, uh, who competed in the, the Olympics later on and was from, uh, I don't know if he was from Pasadena area, but he's from like the somewhere, so, Southern California area. And I'm, I'm blanking on the name. So, you know, forgive me on that, but I'm just like, damn, everybody really, you know, it's the, the veterans community is so small. We really, you know, we really are like a, maybe one or two degrees of separation from, from each other. And, you know, just to, to have that type of history there and to also know that if these guys could understand that, you know what, we all face this adversary, this trauma, and it took us working together to get through it then, you know, there can be, I think there's hope for us in, in getting through whatever this country needs to get through next. So, uh, you know, hearing and, and talking to, you know, these these veterans in the past with the women and the men, it kind of gives me that little bit of hope, you know? Well, yeah, we, when we talk to, you know, you, you think about the cooks in Vietnam, you know, it's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I wasn't infantry, I was a cook. Did the base get shelled? Did you meet people who maybe didn't come back the next day? Like your experience might not have been the same, but what you're, you're processing is very close. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the dirty secrets, and I'm going to let it out. One of the dirty secrets of places like customs and federal law enforcement is it has an exceptionally high suicide rate because, you know, you're taking people from San Antonio, Texas, and dropping them down in small town Montana on the southern border and their parents get sick and they won't let them transfer and they feel hopeless and they, you know it, it's it's like a foreign country to go from San Antonio to Malta Montana um, you know it and they the, there's a lot of suicides because it's just not processed and people don't want to talk like oh well I'm just having some family things well, the family thing's pretty big <laughs> So, and yeah, everyone, it seems like in society, no one wants to put themselves like, how would I put it? It's not, you know, people think if you're, if you're something great happened and, and you talk about it, like I talked to my daughters about it yesterday, what's the line between bragging and just being proud of yourself? And it seems like that line keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller until people think you're bragging. Um, it's the same thing. Like no one wants to be the one to step forward. Everyone wants to push, you know, help others. And, and I think that's when you really do have to look at people like, you know, like your friend, everything is helping others, helping others, but you know, you, you need to take advantage as well. Um, and that's, I mean, Dustin, what would you say your experience is? We've talked to veterans. No, I think uh, when I, when I think about it, I, I always, it's like a, there's not a zero sum game, like, especially when dealing with the VA and, and getting help, like, like, even if, even if we just put aside X amount of money for every guy, right? Not everybody comes home. So there's extra, like you signed the line. That's you, man. And we want to take care of you guys. Yeah. I always feel like, you know, there's not enough, there's not enough civilians there's not a good enough way so that our veterans can hear the civilian community say, we want to take care of you. And we put these things in place specifically so we could take care of you. And if you don't, if you don't use it, then like, I, what do you want us to do? You know, I, there's that big disconnect and, and there's gotta be a better way for us to really cement that in so that, uh, so that the shame of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the shame is gone right like there can't be a there can't there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with you you're just you're just going through the process of your experience and i think that that's the thing that's really stuck out for me in interviewing these guys is everybody's everybody's experience is very specific to their life but the responses to the traumatic events that have happened around them are all very similar and we have ways of taking care of that and like there's no I don't know. I've been really thinking about this a lot. Like, how do we, how do we lionize taking care of yourself? 
And like, you know, the sports industry tries to do it a little bit, but it gets up into people trying to, you know, sell muscle milk or whatever. Like that's where that goes, right? <laughs> But but there's got to be a way, right? Like like there's got to be this way where we're like, look, we're glad you went, and we want to take care of you. How do we how do we get you to believe that? You know, and, and at a, especially at a social level, there's a real there's a real disconnect. It just keeps going every year. You know, every six months, some people rotate out, and that's another group of people that we want to take care of, right? And so I don't know. And and on the flip side. I mean, I, I, sometimes I feel like a, a hypocrite as I'm trying to tell people to get their benefits. I, this shoulder right here doesn't work very well anymore because of training and the government and uh, totally tore it up and can't be fixed medically. Theoretically, not theoretically, I mean, I should be entitled to compensation from the government, but they put so many roadblocks in my way and paperwork gets lost and, oh, you forgot, we forgot to tell you, you need this or that doctor's note doesn't count you have to have it from this certified doctor and you know as at the the end i ended up leaving customs and uh, technically i could still do it but there's so many roadblocks i just kind of gave up and man but i'm going to tell you right now don't be me and wish that you would have persevered and gotten that money like keep up with it i screwed up i did i screwed up and it would be a I don't even know if I can do it anymore. It's probably a closed case now. Don't be me. Like, don't. <laughs> yeah, and it's you know, the, you know, with the the VA, like with any bureaucracy, um, it is hard. It is a it is a challenging system to get through. But the the one thing, uh, jokingly, uh, someone had it in a meme. Basically, the military leaves us with a certain set of skills. That whole hurry up and wait thing. That's just the oh, VA. Yeah. <laughs> it's the VA all over again. Um, so, you know, I don't know if you guys remember the old Ronco commercial, like, uh, you know, basically the paid advertisement. Set it and forget it. So basically, when you file your VA claim, you know, make sure you have all that stuff in th that you need in there. Basically, mm -hmm. break it down Barney style, highlight what you need them to look at. Um, and, you know, basically say on this date, at this time, as you can see in this, you know, letterhead dated this date this date whatever this happened here's the letter that supports it here's this from this doctor here's that from that doctor and i mean your file's gonna be like yay big you know whatever um and it's, it's one of those things it you know it was taking like two or three years and now it's gone down and it's been it's it's still a nightmare to to get through even though um uh it, it, it also depends on where you are in the country, unfortunately, uh, as far as how fast your case is looked at, decided, and things like that. So with the VA, the, 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 the old saying used to be, when you go to one VA, you've gone to one VA, which means that there's, there's no consistency with the VA. If there, if there was a little bit more consistency with uh, how things were handled, managed, I'm talking about the, the hospital side, the benefit side, even the national cemetery side. If there was more consistency and like, you know, someone who can uh, help and advocate on your behalf, which there are, but a lot of people don't know, oh, I need to go to a, uh, how do I get help getting benefits? And, you know, uh, you can go through uh, a veteran service organization. Um, each county of, of the state you live in has one. Mm -hmm. uh, they can, uh, and basically they can help you with uh, filing your service connected claim. They can help you with uh, getting uh, whatever uh, county, state benefits also that are available to, to, to veterans that a lot of people don't, you know, know about depending on the state. Um, they also, if, if you don't want to work with the county, uh, you can go to the legacy organizations. I know American Legion, VFW, uh, Jewish veteran, Jewish veterans of America, I think, um, Vietnam veterans of America, like there's a whole list of, I think, 50 congressionally recognized uh, veteran service organizations that specifically are there to help people with the claims free. It takes time and, and it does. And, you know, it's a doggone shame that you have to kind of go through a third party to to get that assistance with that and that's you know some of the other red tape and what a lot of people don't understand um 
and, and, and that's a challenge. It's, uh, you know, the VA, I think it's one of the, the no, I'm, I was about to say it's the youngest, uh, um, the youngest uh, cabinet. I think that's Department of Homeland Security. I think they're the youngest now. Um, but so they're, they're still kind of young in the, the whole big scheme of, of government. But the thing is, the, I think one of the issues with the, the VA is a lot of people don't necessarily know how it all works. And you're gonna get angry with the VA because, oh, I didn't get my benefits. I can't get my hospital care. Well, when you're mad at the VA, which side of the VA are you mad at? Right. <laughs> you're mad at the hospital side because they lost your spinal tap? Or are you mad at the benefits side because all of a sudden you owe them twenty thousand dollars in back pay for something? We we you know, and it's 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 one of those things. And I understand when folks are, especially veterans, are like, I don't want to deal with the VA. Why do I need to deal with them? And it's like, this is a benefit that was created for us. And you know, if you don't want to use the medical side, that's fine. You know, because if if you can find better medical, okay, go ahead and do it. But at least the benefit side, because everybody uses their GI Bill. Everybody uses a VA home loan. Um, so, you know, basically make sure you use that benefit. It, it's there. Um, you have to dig into it and, 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 and look into it as far as, you know, what you're eligible for and things like that. It's, it's not, it's almost like being in the military again. You're not going <laughs> to, they're not going to tell you. You, you have to do your due diligence and, and get it on your own. And I think at, at, after you get out, you're just like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. I, I did this for X amount of years while I was in the military. Well, I need to do it again. It's like, it is what it is. Um, but it's the, I think that's, that's one of the things that's, that's big in, the, in the, the, the veterans community as well, besides what you know, we were just talking about as far as, ah, somebody has a worse. I, I, I don't need it. I don't need this. Like, no. If, if you're hurting, get it for, for yourself. And at the very least, like there are like survivor benefits that your spouse is entitled to if, yeah. if you should die. So, you know, and a, lo- a lot of things kick in after you die. So if, if anything, if you don't even want to do it for yourself, at least do it for your spouse. So, you know, they, yeah. if, they, if they need something that they can get taken care of. Um, I know there's stuff for uh, like kids as as well. It's it's there's some things that are limited, but and and that and that also depends on uh, the, their state benefits as well, stuff like that. Like the state of California, you know, if you are, um, if you are a, a service connected veteran, like zero to hundred, your kids can get a waiver for college wow. at any of the states, any of the state schools. So. Uh, the any of the I think the the Cal states and any of the 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 UCs it can't be USC of course it's private but come on you, you know and there's a and there's a there's a fee waiver so that that's that's something that's you know but that you you won't know unless you look it up um, and every state is different I know Texas has a lot of benefits for their for their veterans so. they love their veterans in Texas yeah yeah well and like you were saying earlier when you came back. Yeah. I'm a proud black woman. I don't need help. That may be, but why would you not want it? Like it's there. Like you don't have to do it alone. And I worked in the federal building in downtown Seattle and they have the VA office there. And I met a lot of people from the VA and every one of them that I met, I'm not going to say it nationwide, but everyone a hundred percent that I've met is very nice. They care. They want to help you. It's not a soulless bureaucracy. It's just a bureaucracy. They want to help um, you don't have to do it alone. Like they want to help you. Um, you know, maybe you'll find that one person who knows some paperwork tricks and, and can get you through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, yeah. And, and the thing is, too, you know, uh, the I want to say uh, I know that uh, a lot of federal agencies, especially the VA, you I can't tell you how many veterans want to work at the VA, um, and that uh, when they you know can get hired, they actually are hired by the VA. So it's you know, there are veterans out there, you know, doing the best they can and, and, you know, making a difference. So, you know, I mean, I did it for uh, when I was working at, at uh, when I was working at the first VA I worked at and, you know, did it again when I was working uh, out here at the West Los Angeles VA. Uh, and, you know, as long as, I mean, the thing is, I can't basically make the whole VA system better. 
I'm only one person. I'm like a little small cog. But the thing is, if I can make it better for the veterans that I'm working with, for my colleagues, coworkers, and stuff like that, then that's doing something. And that's like at least a step in the right direction. And all those little steps will add up to, to hopefully something good in the long run. So, and you know, with that, with that transition, I know the VA has made a couple of like stumbles and missteps, but you know, my thing is as long as they are working to get better, as long as they're still doing those town halls, as, as long as they are still, you know, uh, you still are able to contact the patient advocate, as, as long as you're still able to, you know, if you have to use the congressional inquiry, use do it. it. Yeah. I mean, I tell my girls, when you look at something like the VA, and, and there are things that need to be fixed, and, and very glaring things that need to be fixed in some cases, I always tell my girls, beware the person who has a simple solution to a complex problem. Mm -hmm. You know, like, oh, if we just do this one thing, it will fix. Like, there's not mm -hmm. one thing that's going to fix the VA. But mm -hmm. if we can start focusing on, like, just a couple small things at a time and just keep, you know, like, uh, what about Bob? Baby steps. You know, yeah. just keep moving forward and fixing it. And, and that is at, at the ground level, the, you know, and, and let's just, there's, there's no bad ideas. <laughs> yeah. And actually giving the, um, giving the employees, the, uh, the opportunity to come up with, if they see a problem, Hey, here's a solution. Let's yeah. try this. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, it's, you know, go ahead and, you know, even if you have to do like a small, like, a, you know, basically do that solution on like a smaller uh, scale and then let's see how it works, tweak it and expand it and keep on doing that. You know, yeah, that's they call it testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and that's another thing you got to fight in the government. I don't know how many times, especially when I was a junior officer. I mean, I was a, a, a GS 13 when I left, so I could actually like make force through some stuff, but I don't know how many times you just, but everyone's got a boss in the government. Like no matter how high I was, I always had bosses. And the, the refrain is, but that's the way we've always done it. It's just such a refrain in the government. That's the way we've yeah. always done it. I, I had a mouth on me and I looked at one of my bosses one day, I was in a bad mood and I was like, well, just cause something stupid doesn't mean we should keep doing it. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know why I got passed over for promotion so many times. <laughs> <laughs> a mystery. Good times. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, a lot of times we ask if you have any advice for veterans, but man, I think we've been really covering that, that well of, of keep with it, keep, you know, just, just stay with it. Don't be me. Don't be wondering what, you know, yeah. if, I, if my paperwork hadn't been lost three times or if they hadn't said, oh no, you need to do this or just turn it in and we'll do the rest. And then I turn it in. They're like, no, no, you have to do it. Yeah, oh, Jesus. Um, it's easy to quit. And I, I'm living proof. It's easy to quit, but it's worth it to not. It's absolutely. And, you know, I'd also, you know, make the suggestion of, you know, that anger that you have with the whatever entity that you're dealing with, you know, let's, let's channel that anger into something uh, positive and in, in moving forward. Um, I know that uh, with the, the VA, um, and I don't know if I told you guys this, um, so so um, one of the things that was in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the documentary, um, Surviving Home, uh, was uh, our, our federal lawsuit. And uh, the, the main reason that we filed the, the lawsuit was uh, um, I uh, got diagnosed with uh, MS and mm. uh, I freaked. Um, like I said, my mom had it. Yeah. I, 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 I freaked out. I said, well, let me go ahead and get all my end of life stuff together. So, you know, get, get, I'm serious. <laughs> I was on know. Saturday. Yeah. <laughs> Will, power of attorney, get it all done. I'm, I'm good. You know, I've done this before. I did it when I was 18, 19 in the military. It's no big deal. Um, wanted to see where I wanted to be buried. And I'm like, okay, got the cemetery. I'm good. Let me go ahead and write for a predetermination of need uh, up at the... Uh, the state run veterans cemetery in I think it was, uh, I can't remember the, the name, but somewhere like middle of nowhere. And I got the letter back saying, dear Mr. Harris, Mr. Harris, uh, yeah, we got, you know, uh, you've been, 
qualify for predetermination need, but they didn't sign the letter. I call them up. I'm like, oh, y'all made a mistake. Uh, not Mr. Harris, Mrs. And they're like, <laughs> we didn't sign the letter. So <laughs> whoops, <laughs> we, we can't. <laughs> um, because at the time, the federal law basically said that uh, uh, the only marriages that were recognized uh, by the feds were uh, opposite sex. Yep. And uh, because of the Defense of Marriage Act. So um, I'm like, I just want to be buried with my wife when I die. You know, she if she perceives me in death. I, you know, I can be buried with her if I precede her, whatever. Um, which is one of those benefits. Yeah. And they were like, the government, the federal government was like, no, you can't do that. I said, well, who's going to complain? The neighbors? <laughs> Everybody's dead. Come on, man. And, you know. The folks in the next plot are going to say, mm, we don't know about them Cooper Harris's now. We got to get up out of here. The neighborhood's going to hell. <laughs> it's a miracle. <laughs> Performing miracles. Yeah, I know. So I said, so we said, you know, something's got to give here. So we, um, so we, we basically uh, went through and got the help of Southern Poverty Law Center for them to basically say, hey, this was an extension of a case that we did in 1973, uh, basically uh, saying that a spouse can be either a man or a woman. So we've done this already. I don't know why the, the federal government is fighting this. And uh, uh, we um, basically filed a federal lawsuit uh, for the VA to recognize my wife as my wife for, for and basically in case of, if I keeled over so she can get whatever right. benefits. Um, and uh, we filed it back in February of uh, 2012 or 2013. And uh, I was saying it was gonna take a couple of years. So they made the decision on our case, I wanna say it was August of 2013 or 14. It's coming up on like seven or eight years now. Wow. Um, so we won the case, <laughs> which was just like, oh, well, okay. <laughs> Ooh, the, the funny thing about the case was, um, so, uh, Basically, we were looking at this, we were suing the, the VA, so that was the benefit side of the VA. I was actually working for the hospital side of the VA. Not awkward at all? Well, no, because look, so just the, the sad thing about this is um, the benefit side and the hospital side don't communicate with each other. They, they don't. Um, and you know this if you file a, a VA claim for benefits, and you say, hey, get all my records from the VA hospital. And they're like, we can't get your records. I'm like, what do you mean you can't get them? Everything is there. What? What are you talking about? That type of thing. So um, some of my friends said, what balls do you have that you're suing the federal government and you're actually working for the department? Uh, which, which was kind of funny. But that's one of those things of, uh, you know, I thought that if this was happening to, to me, I know it's happening to other people. Let me take this craziness I'm going through because everything was in limbo at this point. Like if I kill over tomorrow, nothing's going to, you know, Maggie's not going to get anything. The federal government came in and said, uh, you're suing us and, you know, you don't have no need for this. I'm like, if I don't sue, if I don't do this now, what am I going to do when I'm dead? Because then you're not going to do anything because I'm gone. So uh, at, at this point in time, I thought that if I did this, and I, I, I talked to Maggie about it, and bless her heart, when she saw the, the case, because the, the case official title is is Cooper Harris versus USA. Like, we're suing the whole government. And she was like, oh, we're suing the whole government. She was like, Lord. <laughs> she, she, don't, she doesn't drink and she doesn't cuss too much. Um, and she was like, I need a drink. I said, I, I, I said, are you okay with this? She's like, oh. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, it was it was uh, it was one of those things that I thought if there's a way that I could take the craziness that I was going through, and so no other veteran that were in similar situation that that we were in would have to go through this. Okay, let's 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 do it, and uh, you know, for the most part, it kind of went. It was kind of quiet. I mean, we got we have newspaper clippings, and you know, you can find videos on us. But for the most part, it was pretty quiet. And I was just like, "Oh, this is cool. 
I, I actually did something and it wasn't a whole big hella blue about it and okay this is so it just kind of keeps you wanting to move forward and making sure that whatever i'm doing out here in in life um that it's not about me but it's about like the folks are in similar situations or the folks are coming up behind me because right. isn't that what it's all about everything yeah. in life that's what it's all about right you yeah know? And the, the SOP for the government does kind of seem to be to dare people, you know, they, they just take you for granted. Like, I don't know how many times, like we were told, you're just lucky to have this job. And one of my friends <laughs> exploded on it. It was like, I've got a college degree. Like you're lucky to have me. Right. Tad Foy, shout out. Um, but it is, it's like, they just, they kind of dare you. And then so at some point they catch someone on the wrong day and they say, okay, I'm going to fuck that. I mean, that's, that's why I left the government. They caught me on the wrong day. My dad had died and, uh, you know, I, I was kind of assessing everything of, you know, my dad, his company president had this legacy and I'm like, man, if I got hit by a bus tomorrow, like someone's going to take over my team. Someone's going to take my office. So I'm, I'm already kind of wavering. And then they started giving me crap about my shoulder and they're threatening to take my gun. I was like, wait, I've tr I applied for a bunch of non-uniform jobs and you turned me down because I was too, mm -hmm. too important. And now you're, you're threatening me and so I, this is the wrong day. And I was like, you know, why don't you just keep it? And I resigned. <laughs> and they were like, what? no, you're not supposed to actually call our bluff. <laughs> um, yeah. And so if you're out there and like, you know, call their bluff, like do it. Like it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, the, what are they going to do? You know, basically, uh, bend your dog tag, stamp your meal card, no dessert. <laughs> yeah, or yeah. well, like the veterans we talked to, what are you going to do? Send me to Vietnam? Oh, I'm already here. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing I love about the veterans community, we have this dark sense of humor that, you know, anyone else would be like, oh my gosh, that's so, and it's just like hilarious. We are cackling with laughter on, on that, so. Well, yeah. my wife is an accountant, so you can imagine I'm like a bull in a china shop at their, <laughs> their gatherings. One year, there was some wine and cheese event. I'm like, I already want to kill them. I, yeah, I just, I don't, like, please, whatever can get me out of the wine and cheese event with accountants, please. And had to go, and did, they had a new managing partner for the Seattle office. My wife had me even met him yet and she walked into the kitchen and I was drinking beers with him at the table and she I could see that oh <laughs> my husband's already bowling a china shop he's drinking beers and talking to my boss's boss I'm like I got you he understands the humor yeah <laughs> I got this honey we oh, good it's gonna be fine what could happen <laughs> yeah but you know I ran a counterterrorism team so we'd have you know we'd, we'd donate a, a fondue party at their United Way auction and they'd come over and like Oh my God, like they filed the wrong 1542 to the general ledger. And they're like, so what'd you do? I'm like, um, I had an interview with a terrorist suspect today while the FBI hid behind a wall, but go on. This is fascinating. What you're talking about. <laughs> so, yeah. Good times. <laughs> Fun stuff. Um, Dustin, do you yeah. have anything that you would like uh, to? Yeah. So you played rugby for a little while or what are you doing these days? Did stay active um <laughs> you don't look like uh, you're playing rugby on the regular i guess is what i'm saying <laughs> if, if it wasn't the pandemic he means <laughs> yeah uh so uh i haven't so i'm not officially retired i don't know if i don't know if ruggers actually officially re re retire retire um i guess they do but not really um well i'll play occasionally on not on the advice of, of, of my neurologist and everybody else. Um, so there is usually a, uh, a alumni versus current teams uh, game uh, that uh, I, when I played rugby, uh, in addition to combined services, I also played for Clemson University um, in, in South Carolina. And uh, when I was, when I was, so I, I'm, a, I'm considered a, a Clemson old woman or cow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead and insert the mood jokes and all this stuff. Yeah, go ahead. I'm ready. Go on. It's okay. No, <laughs> I got nothing. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so uh, at homecoming every year, um, they have a alumni versus current team uh, match. And, you know, we're all older. So, of course, we, we cheat. We put like, 
like 30 people on the pitch to their uh, actual 15. Um, you know, they always, it's a, it's a fun game, but uh, so that's, that's the game that I would usually play every, uh, when, when I go back to Clemson every year or every couple of years or so. Um, but uh, besides that, I just, now I'm just, just watching rugby. Um, some of the, the greats that, that I played with in combined services, uh, I know uh, one is actually the coach of the, uh, the U.S. Navy's men's team, I think, the sevens, either the sevens or the cool. fifteens. So I'm just like, okay. I mean, just, uh, you know, and just watching people, you know, in their rugby greatness, basically doing more things now, not actually playing, but actually still uh, giving back to the game. Um, I, I'm, I'm just a fan, just watching and just enjoy, like, either YouTube or Instagram videos or, you know, Facebook or whatever of, of, of rugby whenever so that's that's it for, for my uh rugby playing days and just you know uh our delusions of grandeur about how, how great we were <laughs> and the, the, the botcherous things that we did uh you know in our you know 20s and and 30s when we were still playing rugby but that's a, that's about it <laughs> i don't think it's cheating i think you're called wily veterans <laughs> yeah um and the, the funny thing is so even with the uh basically we we say we're, we're we're cheating, but when you have thirty people on the field for the alumni side and the the fifteen for the the, the current team, what we don't tell you is that uh, usually the extra people are just wandering the field, <laughs> um, and basically like after like the first or second play, they have all meandered over to the sidelines. Um, <laughs> so the people who are actually like the newer alumni are actually playing the the, the current team. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, usually halftime is when the first person throws up, which is usually <laughs> like within 15 minutes of the game. One year, they actually, uh, the current team actually got a real referee out there and we had a real game and we still won. <laughs> Legit. <laughs> so, you know, age and treachery beats youth and their inexperience all the time. Every and time. Every time. time. <laughs> so it was, it, it was, it was good stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I still, still love, still love rugby. Actually, that's how I met my wife. So it's good stuff all, all around. I can't, uh, it's like the, the best sport on earth. And actually, uh, if it, you know, one of the things when I, when I came back home from, uh, deployment, like I, like I was saying earlier, if it wasn't for rugby, I, I probably wouldn't be here either. Um, just because uh, rugby was the one thing that kept me going after, uh, after I, after I came back home and basically having that, that sense of camaraderie, uh, the teammates and stuff like that. There were a couple of, uh, apparently there were a couple of social workers on the team that were always kind of keeping an eye on me and like, hey, you okay? And I'm like, I'm fine, what are you talking about? And I didn't realize that, you know, I was showing signs and symptoms of, of something being slightly off. I just thought I was, oh, I'm fine, and, you know? So I, my, my hat's off to, to, to my, uh, my, my teammates and the folks I played with uh, for, for keeping me uh, sane uh, all that time too. And like I said, rugby, I think is like uh, the closest you can get uh, to being back in the, back in the military. You have a bunch of folks that are working hard, playing hard, doing stuff that absolutely nobody else understands. Everybody else thinks you're crazy for doing. And then you drink <laughs> and eat and socialize and sing rowdy songs and yeah, all that good stuff. So. Perfect. Well, I can't thank you enough for, for being on. This has just been a, an incredible episode, a fun talk. Um, I'm, I'm noticing by the time I'm going to have to go check in on my daughters and start helping with dinner, or I won't be eating any. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much uh, for being on. Uh, if you're listening on any of the podcast stations, Apple, Spotify, uh, Stitcher, I think we're Spreaker or something like that. We got on yesterday. Google. Everywhere. Yeah. Please give us a like, give us a rating. Uh, we're, we're very new to this and definitely would love your help. Tell your friends. In fact, tell your enemies for all I care as long as they listen. <laughs> but, um, but thank you so much for being on. You've been listening to the Know Their Story podcast. If you made it this far, we must be doing something right. Let us know by subscribing to our channel. And think about sitting down with the veterans in your life. 
because saying thank you for your service should be the beginning of the conversation, not the end.